I want to welcome you to Austin Heights Baptist Church this third Sunday of Easter. Will you join me in the greeting? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Now I invite you to stand and greet each other with these ancient words of encouragement. The Lord be with you. As you're making your way back to your seats, those of you who are seated on the outside, seat pocket in front of you has a black notebook. It's a way we keep up to date with one another, contact information. I invite you to pass that, complete it, and pass it along to others on your row. On the inside of the order of service are some announcements. As you look over those, let me call on a couple of folks. Uh, first of all, Dixie, you've got a quilt for us. Come and tell us about it. It is our honor today to present David Duke Henson with this beautiful blue quilt. Isn't it? Because he loves blue and he loves cosmic things. So there's stars and planets. David has had some uh, chronic health issues and recently he had a UTI that went se se systemic. And the prayers today are for his healing and for him to gain strength. And David, it's so good to see you here. You yeah. and Jenny are such a wonderful part of our congregation. So when you get this quilt, you're gonna make a square knot, right over left, left over right, and say your prayer for our Duke. And uh, we're just, we're happy to have you. Quilt is also so Jenny can throw it over him sometimes. And tell him. Uh, you also see uh, there are things on this afternoon and during the week about youth and to tell us more and make explanations and changes. Uh, Christina, come and talk to us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So the youth today, it says 3 to 6, but it's 3.30 to 6, so our regular time. We're finishing up with the garage sale items, and we're setting up, we're gearing up for our bingo night. That's happening again this Friday, bingo night number two. And on, at our garage sale yesterday, we made over $1,000. So thank you, everyone, who made it um, possible for us to do this sale, the parents who showed up. The youth that showed up, there were youth that even aren't even in youth group that were doing work, like Ethan, So, and, and to all of you for your donations and time. And then the last thing was, um, I do have a clipboard. If you haven't already, please consider signing up to bring a prize item for our second um, garage sale, or bingo, this Friday. Of course, we've learned some of us that this bingo stuff, there's some people who are very serious about bingo. <laughs> so I thought it was just gonna be a sort of easy going, everybody sit around and talk, play bingo. They telling us to be quiet. <laughs> anyway. But it's a good fundraiser for the youth. Jerry? Why don't you mention that there will not be Sundays for the next two Sundays. I will be out of town, we have a trip planned and then 
little granddaughter Serena told you we remember we will be getting married in May. So we're traveling to Kansas for a uh, couple's bridal shower. So we're very excited about that. So uh, I will send you some readings, by the way. I don't know how much you read, but I know Sunday school the next two Sundays. Very good. Thank you, Jerry. Um, you see other announcements this week. Gen uh, church council is coming up. Um, and then you see on next Saturday is the African American Heritage Project yard sale. Some of the leftover items from our garage sale is going to be going to them. So if you missed out this time, you have a second <laughs> chance. So, Maggie, good and loud. Okay, uh, and then you notice that next Sunday, a um, week from today, depending on weather, we will have our outdoor worship service, annual outdoor worship service, Earth Day, uh, followed by potluck. Uh, there'll be email and Facebook announcements about the potluck kind of stuff, but uh, we've learned over the last few years that it is a lot easier and convenient for everybody to do our outdoor service out here rather than going all the way down to the prayer garden. It's just easier and safer to get. And if you need to know more about that, there'll be, again, information on Facebook and emails and, and church uh, uh, newsletter, but also you can speak to me about that. Um, and then finally, let me also mention one other thing. Vic has an announcement about her recital, which originally was scheduled for Sunday, but this last Friday night, the other night, she had the lead in the opera at SFA, and I mean, she was good. <laughs> uh, and let's all say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Uh, tell us about your recital. So my recital was supposed to be this coming Sunday, a week from today, uh, with my schedule and the way things have gone this semester. It is being postponed, um, not long. I'm still graduating. <laughs> I'm, I'm still graduating, um, but we're looking at late May, early June, so summer recital. Okay, so she'll let us know. Thank you, Vic. Any other announcements? Are we having choir practice? Speak loud. Are we having choir practice tonight? Choir practice is yes. That's tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Okay, as we've done the last several weeks, let's breathe together, but let's follow this ancient method of a breath prayer. Uh, I mean, this goes back centuries. So we'll begin with you taking a deep breath and slowly exhaling this phrase, be still and know that I am God, is from Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. And now breathe out, be still and know. Be still. Be. Let us worship God.
you join me in the call to worship? Christ is with us. Christ is with us. He does not come to us in searing lights and dramatic ways. He comes quietly as a friend who walks beside us on an ordinary day. He is everywhere, waiting for us, walking with us, calling to us to follow. Christ is with us. Christ is with us. Let us worship him in joy. Let us follow him in faith. join me in prayer. Lord, help and guide us in believing in and following Christ, even if it isn't logical to us. Help us to walk by our faith and invite Christ into our lives. Guide us in sharing our faith with others and to not be frightened when Christ comes to greet us. Help us to recognize when you come to us. In the name of the love of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We invite the children to come down the front to see Aunt Judy and any child that wants to come. Some grown-ups, if you really want to come, come on. You are welcome. <laughs> Ethan, why don't we start around this way? So good to see everybody here this morning. This is a bigger crowd than we usually have. I love it. <laughs> okay, our scripture today is another thing that happened on Easter Day. Do you remember? We all know what happened at the very first thing in the morning on Easter. What was that? He rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Then last week we talked about something else that happened on Easter Day. Winter, do you remember? So what were they doing? Yes. And Jesus came to them. That's right. Well, we're going to hear another story today about something that happened on Easter Day. And this is another disciple of Jesus that we don't hear a lot about. His name was Cleopas. And it says, Cleopas says, I can't figure it out. Peter says Jesus' body is gone. And Mary says she saw Jesus. She said Jesus isn't dead anymore. I don't believe that, said the other disciple. When someone is killed, they are dead. They don't come alive again. It was the Sunday after Jesus was killed. The two disciples were going along the road to a town called Emmaus. As they walked, a stranger came and walked with them. They didn't know who he was. 
What are you talking about, asked the stranger, and why are you so sad? Well, where have you been, asked Cleopas. Are you the only one around who doesn't know all the things that have been going on? What things, asked the stranger. The rulers, said Cleopas, and the soldiers, they hated Jesus, and they killed him. Why did they hate Jesus, the stranger wanted to know. Who knows? Maybe they thought Jesus was going to start an army and fight them. Jesus told us he would be killed. Then Jesus said he would come alive again in three days. That's pretty hard to believe. Anyway, here it is the third day since he was killed. Mary of Magdala says she's, that she's seen him and he's alive, but I don't believe her. As far as we know, Jesus is dead. Then the stranger began to talk to them. The stranger told them the story of Moses and all the prophets. Do you find it hard to believe that Jesus was killed, asked the stranger. Do you find it hard to believe that he came alive again? Yeah, we sure do, said Cleopas. The three of them reached the town of Emmaus. Why don't you come in and stay with us, they said to the stranger. It's almost dark outside. Besides, you must be hungry. Soon they were ready to have a meal together. Then the stranger took a piece of bread and broke it. He gave Cleopas and the other disciples pieces of bread. Suddenly, Cleopas remembered. He remembered the Last Supper that Jesus had with his friends. He remembered how Jesus had broken the bread and passed it out to them. It's you, shouted Cleopas. It's you, Jesus, you are alive. And then the stranger was gone. We should have known, said Cleopas, when we were walking along, the way he talked to us, I felt warm and good inside as I listened to him. We should have known it was Jesus. We should have believed what Mary told us. And I think what I want us to think about today, just a minute, is that we need to wait for the times when we feel Jesus near. We, Okay, um, so we need to listen and wait and um, feel when Jesus is near. And what I want to tell you about is when I was a little girl, and it's real. It's sometimes that I'm thinking back, and when I was a little girl, I really did think I could feel Jesus close to me. And the times that I felt it the most was sometimes when I was with my family. This feeling of big love would just come over me because of how much my family loved me and how much I loved them. That was a time Jesus was close to me. Sometimes when I was outside playing, I would just feel how awesome the outdoors was and how close I felt to nature. And that was a time I knew Jesus was close to me. Then, when I was at church with my family and my friends, learning about Jesus and praying and worshiping together, and especially for me in the music that we sang, that's when I could feel Jesus near. So I want you guys to think about what are the times that I feel Jesus near? Let's say a prayer. Help us to watch and listen for those special times that we can feel close to Jesus. Loving Jesus, keep us close. Amen. Amen. And you are going back to Children's Church with Miss Dixie and Mr. Clark again because you're working on a special song. <laughs> Now we're at the place for our prayer time, prayer of concerns. On the back page of the order of service is our ongoing prayer list, both prayers of praise and gratitude, but also prayers of concern. Ushers are coming forward with cards. If you would be willing to send a card or more than one to people on this list or others we mentioned, telling them that we're praying for them. It is a great, it's a simple, task, but great encouragement, uh, an act of hope to send to someone uh, a prayer card. Now, as you look over the list, let me uh, mention some things. First of all, you see number 42, Joan Watson.
Loving God, hear our prayer this morning. On this Easter season, Easter tide Sunday, the third Sunday in such a time, we continue to pray in the hope and joy of the resurrection. Things weigh us down and the world is hard. Illness and disease and death and grief and violence and on and on. We pray you renew us. We pray you change us and help us be your children of light in this world. Help us share your healing and hope and encouragement and love. And help us, oh God, pay attention, listen and learn for the very interesting and surprising places and ways you show up in this world and in our lives. This and more through Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins first in silence. Please join me in the corporate confession. O oh God, we confess that we are slow to see the risen Christ among us. We are slow to believe in his presence and grace. We are often confused and frightened by the realities around us, and also confused and frightened you offer us. Come into our lives, we pray, and bring us to the fullness of life in your kingdom. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
I will be reading Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35 from the Living Bible. That same day, Sunday, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles out of Jerusalem. As they walked to the village, as they walked along, they were talking of Jesus' death when suddenly Jesus himself came along and joined them and began walking beside them. But they didn't recognize him, for God kept them from it. You seem to be in a deep discussion about something, he said. What are you so concerned about? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. And one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about the terrible things that happened there last week. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did incredible miracles and was a mighty teacher, highly regarded by both God and man. But the chief priests and our religious leaders arrested him and handed him over to the Roman government to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had thought he was the glorious Messiah, that he had come to rescue Israel. And now, besides all this, which happened three days ago, some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb earlier this morning and came back with an amazing report that his body was missing that they had seen some angels there who told Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, Jesus' body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, You are such foolish, foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted by the prophets that the Messiah would have have to suffer all these things before entering his time of glory. Then Jesus quoted them passage after passage from the writings of the prophets, beginning with the book of Genesis and going right on through the scriptures, explaining what the passages meant and what they said about himself. By this time they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus would have gone on, but they begged him to stay the night with them as it was getting late, so he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he asked God's blessing on the food and then took a small loaf of bread and broke it and was passing it over to them when suddenly it was though their eyes were open. They recognized him, and at that moment he disappeared. They began telling each other how their hearts had, had felt strangely warm as he talked with them and explained the scriptures during the walk down the road. Within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem when the 11 disciples and other followers of Jesus greeted them with these words, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
Thank you, Vic, Mary. Let us pray. Well, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a boy, there was a big oak tree beside the road between Abilene and Stamford. Now, in a world of scrub brush and shin-sized oaks, mesquite bushes and prickly pear cactus, a large oak tree was something of significance. The road went around it, making a slight bend in an otherwise straight line, therefore lending even more significance to this big tree. Now we didn't know its significance, but my brother and I speculated on it endlessly as our family passed it time and time again over the years. Was it a, a hanging tree? Was it a hiding place for a cowboy while a band of Comanches rode by? Was it a meeting place for outlaws or perhaps a landmark for a rancher? Now by the time I was a teenager, the road had been improved and expanded into a four lane highway with the Grand Oak standing in the middle of the northbound lanes on one side and the southbound lanes on the other. Eventually, I think while I was in college, a speeding drunk driver hit the tree, destroying it, destroyed his car. I think he got away with some scratches. But to this day, when we're driving that route, I can tell you exactly where that tree used to be. Now looking back, I wonder about the road going around a tree instead of removing the tree. Now, if it had been an interstate highway, that tree would have been cut down so the straight line could continue unhindered. But there would have been no speculation about that old tree by West Texas travelers. There would have been no imaginative storytelling by little boys. Somewhere, sometime, many years before, someone in the highway department or someone working for the county decided to respect the local source of wonderment, that old tree, and decided to build the road around the tree instead of over it. It makes me wonder. Back in 1969, Wendell Berry wrote in one of his early essays about the difference between a path and a road, or we might say instead of road, a path and a highway. He says, a path is not destructive. It's the perfect adaptation through experience and familiarity of movement to place. It obeys the natural contours. Such obstacles as it meets, it goes around. A road, highway on the other hand, even the most primitive one embodies a resistance against the landscape. Its reason, its, its reason is not to simplify the necessity for movement, but haste. Its wish is to avoid contact with the landscape. It seeks as far as possible to go over the country rather than through it. Barry writes later in 1988, a little short novel called Remembering, and the character is a farmer, writer, sort of like Wendell himself, coming home after being on the West Coast, flies into the airport, gets into his old pickup and starts driving up I-71 uh, in the direction of the home place and the farm. And Wendell writes, the eight lanes of the interstate became six and then four, traffic thins. The city is behind him now, except for the road itself that is the city's hardened affluent passing through its long gouge without respect for what was there before it or for what is there now alongside it. The road reminds him, as it always has before, of the power of words removed from what they are about. For the road is a word conceived elsewhere and laid across the country in the wound prepared for it. A word made concrete and thrust among us. This morning in our reading, Luke says, the word, 
not the word made concrete and thrust among us, but the resurrected word made flesh and living among us. And it all happens, Luke says, this word living among us in the flesh, resurrected flesh, happens on a road, really a path. Now, I love this story of the Emmaus Road. Long, I, I have long <coughs> loved it. It's on Easter Sunday, late in the afternoon. Two disciples we've not met before are trudging home to their small village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now, part of why I like this story is that it's a simple reminder that though they have been up to Jerusalem and have heard the astounding news of Jesus' resurrection, they still have to get home by the end of the day. Now maybe they have family they need to see or fix supper for. Maybe there are animals to be tended, cows to be milked, chickens to be cooked up. Well, the greatest cosmic event of all history has occurred that very morning, the resurrection. The mundane chores of the home place must be tended. The children must be put to bed and the dishes must be washed. And here's the thing. The resurrected Jesus appears right in the middle of all of this. This is on Easter Sunday, the first day of the new creation. In the resurrection of Christ, God shatters the chains of evil. The powers of sin and death do their very best to destroy God's goodness in the flesh on the cross. But God in Christ absorbs the worst sin and death can do overcomes it and is resurrected as the inauguration of God's new creation. When in Christ, the entire universe starts anew, healing and hope and justice and peace starts breaking into this old creation, grace begins overcoming disgrace. And this astounding event in human flesh comes to this little road in a small dusty town with a single yellow flashing light, some boarded up buildings and a convenience store gas station on the corner among two disciples trying to get home in time to feed the dogs and get supper ready for the kids. I remember back in the fall of 1980, one of my professors in the religion department at Baylor asked me if I'd be interested driving out to a small country church and preach. Now, they were looking for a pastor, and if I went out there, uh, it would mean that I was open to being considered as a pastor. He gave me directions to the church, and early that Sunday morning, I drove down the interstate until I exited onto a state highway, driving quite a long ways. Then I turned into a farm-to-market road for a while before turning onto a county road, a paved path, really, and finally up a hill on a dirt drive to the church. And there it stood. Small, simple, plain little church building. And oh, it looks so forlorn to me. Forgotten, overlooked. Now a few weeks before, I had preached in a thriving brick church just off the interstate, not a 15 minute drive from Waco. They too were looking for a pastor, but decided to keep looking. The report that came back to me was they really liked my preaching, but I was too young and I was unmarried. <laughs> well, I couldn't do anything about getting married, but I grew my, I grew, that's when I grew a mustache. And since I was wearing contact lens, I bought a pair of intellectual looking uh, eyeglasses with plain glass in them. And every time it was time to read something, read scripture, I'd reach into my pocket and with great drama and flourish, put the glasses on, all in the hope of looking older. I've got to quit that habit of trying to look older at this point in my life. Well, I, whether it worked or not, that week, that Sunday, that little congregation way off the beaten path voted to call me as pastor, 12 to 1. And I stayed there four and a half years. The brick church just off the interstate was somewhere. And now I was the pastor of a little church in the middle of nowhere, which is exactly where the living Christ shows up. 
Now these two disciples are walking home a little along this little dusty road, or for our purposes this morning, a path. Even today, the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus is not much. It's paved, it's well tended, mostly because of the tourist buses and pilgrims coming to visit the little church in modern Emmaus. But it's still a small road to a small village. Now in the first century, it was much more like a path. The word we translate, of course, from the Greek as road can also be translated as way or path. There was a more impressive, well-built Roman road coming into Jerusalem uh, from Jerusalem's west side from the coast, Caesarea Maritima. It was the Roman headquarters for the governor, Pontius Pilate. It was the headquarters for the Roman military, the elite Italian cohort. Rome built their famous highways so they could move imperial troops quickly and efficiently to any place the empire needed Roman rule and order. At the same time, Roman taxes could be extracted quickly and efficiently back to Rome. Now, in contrast, the road to Emmaus was a peasant road, little more than a trail formed by poor working people getting back and forth to jobs in Jerusalem or maybe working in the nearby fields, while the Roman imperial roads, or what we might call highways, like the empire itself, plowed through and over anything in the way. The peasant paths went along with the contours of the land, alongside the creeks, around a big old tree, or skirting the edge of a hill. Now, I bet you never thought that highways and roads can be making political statements, but they do. Empires often tend to build highways. They just assume things like this can be done, interstates, autobahns. Peasants and poor people, small towns and villages have paths and trails. Empires impose and intrude while small towns and villages cooperate and work alongside. As these two disciples are walking home, a stranger comes up and joins them on the journey, the Word made flesh living with us. And even though they don't yet know it, he asks, what are you fellows talking about? And they stop dead in their tracks in shock. What? You must be the only person from Jerusalem who has not heard what's been happening over the last few days. I mean, don't you do social media? The living Jesus responds, well, what things? What are you talking about? And they reply excitedly, man, oh, man, have we got a lot to tell you. Jesus of Nazareth, the great prophet of God in word and deed, was handed over by the religious authorities and was tortured and lynched. We had hoped he was the one who was going to set all of us free. And even though all that happened three days ago, we heard from some women in our group this morning that he was alive. Some others of our group went to the tomb and to check it out, and though they didn't see him, they said the tomb was indeed empty. And in the original Come to Jesus meeting, Jesus says, What's the matter with you? You're dim-witted and you are small-hearted. Why don't you believe the Bible and what the prophet said? This is exactly what was foretold would happen to the Messiah. Then Luke says, for the rest of the walk home, Jesus explained the scriptures to them about himself. Now looking back later, the disciples realized the resurrected Christ, the bright morning star, the Alpha and the Omega was with them right there on that dusty little path. They exclaimed to one another, wow, we did not recognize him even though our hearts were burning within us while he was talking with us on the road, on the path, while he was teaching scriptures to us. And at the end of the story, when they have run seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the rest of the disciples, they say, the Lord is risen indeed. And Luke adds that they told what had happened to them on the road and how he had been known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now the early church would have looked at one another and smiled and nodded when they heard this story. 
because there are all these little metaphors and images and phrases that just click with what they did on a, on a weekly basis and daily basis. They knew about knowing the living Christ on the way, on the road, on the path. This thing apparently happened so often in one way or another. That road and way and path became a metaphor for the whole Christian life. The living Christ was known on the way, not tied down, not the distant, unmoved mover of Aristotle, not the implacable, unchanging God of fundamentalism, and not the abstract, Gnostic, sacred flow of some kind of generalized spirituality of progressives. Luke says that the God of the universe is known to us in the living Christ, right on the dusty roads and paths and villages and neighborhoods where we live and walk. Now, as we participate in mission, as we get off the couch, come out of our comfort zones and join with others on the journey of following the living Christ in service and justice and healing and peacemaking, we recognize him on the path, on the way, on the journey. Indeed, in the book of Acts, the earliest designation of the church was people of the way, or we might translate it this morning, People of the path. I remember years ago in the early 90s when Austin Heights had uh, the first prayer service called A Service of Hope for Those Whose Lives Have Been Touched by HIV, HIV AIDS. This sacred place was filled with our church members and gay men and parents of gay men and various families who had somehow been affected by HIV AIDS. From all over, people came to pray and to hear a word of hope and comfort. A month or so afterwards, one of our key deacons and leaders, Dwayne Key, taught at SFA, was on his way home um, from SFA he saw a young family pulled over on the side of the road, and it was a hot afternoon. The young man was pushing the car, and inside, in the sweltering heat of the car steering it, was a young woman, and by side, beside her was this little baby. Dwayne pulled over, offered to help. Come to find out they were out of gas, so Dwayne loaded them all up in his pickup where there was air conditioning, and they went to get gas. When they came back to the car to put gas in it, the young couple thanked Dwayne for help, and the young mother said, I recognize you. Aren't you from the church that had the AIDS prayer service? Our baby is HIV positive from a blood transfusion I received during pregnancy, and we were there. On the way, on the path, we will know the living Christ. Now, the testimony of those disciples was that the resurrected Christ walked among them on the road, but also they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Those early hearers of this story would also have smiled at this. They knew. They knew that Jesus, the living word, had taught those two disciples on the road about the Bible, the written word, and preached a sermon to them. And they knew that in the Holy Communion of the Lord's Supper, they recognized the living Christ Jesus right there beside them. Very early in this same AIDS ministry that I'm talking about in the early 90s, this was around 1991 or something like that, I remember going to visit a young man who was dying from AIDS. He was the first full-blown AIDS patient that I had visited in, a, in their home. And in this case, it was a trailer out somewhere in the woods, down a barely paved country, county road, and then off on a sandy path. His partner was waiting anxiously for me and took me <coughs> inside where the young man dying was in bed, feeble, and barely able to talk. Now, out of the clear blue, it just occurred to me, I said, would you like something to drink or can you eat? His partner said there was Coke in the refrigerator, and I asked, were there any crackers or uh, bread? And he said, yeah, and yes, it's all right. He could eat as long as it's in small amounts and very slowly. Well, they had a loaf of Ms. Baird's light bread in the cabinet, 
and I took a slice, poured three glasses of Coca-Cola, distributed them among us. I broke one small piece of that light bread for the young man in the bed and placed it on his tongue, saying, this is the body of Christ broken for you. I said this, and his partner started weeping, and he started weeping. We all ate pieces of light bread, then we each sipped some Coca-Cola. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you. There in a trailer in the woods on a sandy path, two gay men, one of them dying, and I shared the feast of life of Coca-Cola and Ms. Baird's light bread, and we prayed in the hope of the resurrection Christ gives us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, mother of us all. Amen. Amen. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts, and we pray your blessing in using them um, in the service of your will. We pray that you remind us to look for you everywhere, every day, because you can appear to us anywhere, um, but that we can perhaps see you best not on the highways that impose their will on your world, but on the paths that find their way to it. Please give us your grace, Lord, to see you on any path that we may be on. In your son's name we pray, amen. 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 Ask you to remain standing. Open your hymn books to number 477. This is a great singing hymn. I know people who, this is their favorite hymn. <laughs> 
And in a moment when we sing this hymn, I will be here at the front to receive anyone who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, saying that you want to be a part of Austin Heights Baptist Church. We'll receive you as we sing. and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and give you grace. May the countenance of God be upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 